Hi, uh, welcome to Future Fast, and we have a very special guest today. And uh, uh, before I uh, introduce him, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, Future Fast is an effort to bring people who are doing things that are bound to have an impact in the future. And the idea is to get them to have this conversation to understand what are they doing, how are they doing things differently, or how are they preparing for the future, and perhaps we could take some tips and uh, apply it in our businesses or in our life. And uh, with that, I hope you uh, you enjoy the ride. And uh, also, uh, uh, Zoltan Ishtwan, that's the guest today. And uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the name, he's a futurist, if I can say that. He is the most uh, famous uh, or the biggest name uh, from a point of... Uh, 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 he, he's a... Uh, tra transhumanism, I think. Transhumanism. <laughs> he's the biggest name in transhumanism. And he's an author, he's a journalist who's traveled across uh, over 100 countries. And he's also uh, an entrepreneur uh, and uh, a filmmaker. So, you know, the list goes on. And uh, uh, I really urge uh, each of you to look up, uh, look up the links given below uh, to know more about him. And uh, while uh, Zoltan, thank you so much for uh, making time to, uh, you know, uh, discuss or uh, get us know you and uh, uh, and also what you're trying to do. So can you, for our audience and listeners, uh, define uh, transhumanism or transhumanist? Who is a transhumanist? Sure. Well, transhumanism is usually just people that want to use science and technology to radically modify the human body. But um, I like to think of it as like the top 10% most extreme science. So uh, artificial intelligence, for example, in the news a lot lately, is, a, is, is you know, a critical part of transhumanism. So is genetic editing. But we're the kind of people that put uh, exoskeleton suits on the disabled so that they can now get out of a wheelchair and walk around. But we're also the same sort of people that might put an exoskeleton suit on a uh, Olympic runner and then try to get that Olympic runner to even run faster than he's ever run or she has ever run before. And so... Um, Transhumanism is really just trying to expand the human capabilities using science and technology. And you'd be surprised there are many millions of transhumanists around the world. Uh, I think the, the big question is really whether you call yourself that. But most people I know would like to use radical science to, to upgrade and improve their lives. Well, uh, uh, Zoltan, uh, you come from uh, philosophy and religion as an academic background, right? Your grounding happened in that. And uh, by the lifestyle, you are uh, an adventurist, right? You, you are so much into adventure and uh, thrill and some of the things you've done. And I urge our listeners and audience to look you up online uh, are kind of the what people do living in the edge, right? And uh, someone who challenges and uh, then uh, you are a transhumanist yourself. So how, how does this happen? I mean, uh, is there a contradiction or am I reading it wrong? No, 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 there is, you know, and I, I think a lot of people most, I guess, know me uh, because I began my career at National Geographic. But one of the things I did at National Geographic was I uh, invented the sport of volcano boarding, going down a, a vol active volcano and snowboarding down it. But it's, it's an active volcano. There's no snow. So it, it's called volcano surfing or volcano boarding. And it's very dangerous. And People always ask, how can I both believe in transhumanism and trying to overcome biological death with science and still take chances? Well, I think the main thing about transhumanists is that they really love life. That's why they want to try to live forever or at least live you know, thousands of years because they love life so much. And so I love life too. And I think that's been a critical balance between loving my life and the adventurous life that I have to trying to do scientific things um, to make it live longer and hopefully not die, at least not in the traditional way that we normally die. I mean, most transhumanists I know would at least like to live 500 years. And so that's our, our main priority and our main goal. Uh, Zoltan, don't uh, please take it as a personal comment, but uh, 
see what is it that we as humans can't achieve in 80 to 100 years that we can hope to achieve with 1000 years of life well I, i think you know that's a good question i think the most important thing about transhumanism to understand is that we and it's funny because i'm i'm at the university of oxford right now doing a graduate degree in philosophy and i just wrote a paper on this a lot of times when we think about the future we only think about it as a biological being we think about it as i'm zoltan this is what i do you know uh, you you are you everyone else is that we think of it in terms of our biology we have 3 pounds of meat in our head our brain is weighs about 3 pounds that's how we think of the world as humans but that's not how it's going to be in 100 years as you can already tell from ai and all these other changes taking place you know in 100 years from now i would be very surprised if we are even 50% biologically human anymore because we will have replaced so many of our body parts we will be uploaded into ai or at least have it in our head uh, just like we have it in our phone but we'll have it in our brain real time so when we think about the future what can we do in the future you're right maybe 80 years is a lot for a human future but we're not going to be human in the f- I- anymore um we're going to need thousands and thousands of years and i'm talking about going off planet because now maybe we don't have to breathe oxygen anymore because we have something called a bio lung which allows us to just go and not have to worry about oxygen anymore or we you know we have we were not uh, you know privy to all these different types of you know cold or heat or having to drink water or eat food once we become transhuman and cyborg like we'll be able to do so many more things and hopefully we'll get off planet earth and go explore the galaxies i think we were destined to do how how do you think this will shape the humanity as we know it today because we still identify with uh, even race no matter how much we want to call it otherwise right and religion faith uh, nationality and uh, so much a fight about identity so how do you think uh, this will shape out with this sense of you uh, you know transhumanist our humanism well it's hard to know how the future will shape you know a, a year ago before chat gpt uh an ai would have said oh well humans will become transhuman and we'll use ai to improve ourselves but what's happened is that ai has actually accelerated its growth so much faster than let's say biotechnology or you know using our consciousness to uh become a part of a computer like all of a sudden there were these two fields transhumanism and ai research and all of a sudden ai research went much 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 faster and now i'm a little bit afraid that it might be ai that actually ends up being the transhuman entity with supreme intelligence and able to explore the cosmos and it just leaves us humans behind um so it, it is a changing world and transhumanism is always you know optimistic but it doesn't mean it's going to turn out right uh science is, but the good news is that science historically has always improved the human race it's been very rare that science has actually harmed us and so i'm i'm confident that hopefully science will continue to help us and change uh the environment so that we can become a better species and and just a a more interesting species like i said if we can do all sorts of things go off planet you know i mean the the whole universe is there for us to explore well in that context how do you think we should prepare for this transhumanist future Well I think the very first thing we need to do is we we sort of have to get a hold of how far artificial intelligence is going to go because it's changing the world so much for writers for futurists for doctors for everybody and we have to decide is that really beneficial to the human race I think artificial intelligence is beneficial but we have to be careful that it doesn't completely leave us behind so I think that's a very important thing to do I think the other thing if you know on a practical advice level when people come to me and say what should i do to be a transhumanist especially if they're young i say well go into the stem subjects um you know go into the science and technology and engineering and math mathematics subjects and, and study that because that's really where the future is so if you really want a future that is going to kind of bring the transhuman promise you have to study the things the sciences and technologies that bring are going to make it happen Um I mean that doesn't mean you don't want to be an accountant it doesn't mean you don't want to be a construction worker it doesn't mean you don't want to be a lawyer but the the fields of transhumanism are almost entirely science and technology so that you know maybe philosophy like myself but really it's it's mostly so those are the fields to go into to change the transhuman future see how do we prepare our children because you know we bring them up with some sense of uh, end goal right i mean you need to study this complete this get to work and get to this point of make a family and you know it 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 the whole uh, outlook 
irrespective of which part of the world we live in, the faith we belong to, it's it's always uh, there is a linearity to the life from a point of A to the end point of B, right? So in such a sense, how do we, what do we educate the children? How do we tell them what, uh, I mean, how do we approach this whole thing? Well, you know, it has changed. I, I think because of AI, there is this this kind of gorilla in in the room now, or elephant in the room, as they like to say, that maybe going to college won't even be useful for children. So, for example, I have two daughters. I have a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old. And so, you know, let's just take the 9-year-old. She has uh, nine more years before she goes off to college. Now, AI is already replacing journalism jobs. It's already doing a better job of medical scans when it comes to cancer scanning and and things like that for cardiologists it, it's already better at uh, it's already solving some uh, legal cases so and that's today now let's say it exponentially grows grows like most technology will my kids even go to college will it even be useful for them maybe they'll end up just doing jobs that ai can't do better and i'm not even sure what really that is uh, for example i'm at my winery in napa valley right now and um, maybe making wine because it requires a personal touch is something that uh, will humans will always want to do and always be very good at. Um, so, and, and maybe it's it's beyond the AI. You don't want an, an, an artificial entity touching your wine. You want human hands, human love, human care. Um, so those are the ways that I am already beginning to look at how to prepare for my daughters. <laughs> but I can tell you that it has greatly changed in the last few years because of AI and how much the future is changing because of technology. Um, there's very good chance within nine years, there will be, you know, 99% of the software coders will be replaced. And, and think of technology, that's a huge jump. And if you can't code software, which is one of the most difficult jobs on the planet Earth, then, you, you know, what else, what else can AI do? It can do everything. So I think it's a very different world. But I think most importantly, I'm still teaching my kids be nice, take care of yourself, eat healthy, um, embrace the future, embrace progress. So those are things that still stand strong, but uh, whether they go to college or not anymore, or whether it's useful, I don't know anymore. Uh, what do you think government should be doing? I, I know you also uh, attempted at becoming the, I mean, you applied for the biggest job in the world, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, see. So how do you think government should, uh, or what do you think they should be doing? Uh, you, you mean people in general? What should they be doing? Government. How how do you? Is oh. there a role for governments? How, what can they do? Uh, you know, as policymakers. And... Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult too because here AI might actually be better at policies just because it has no biases. If they can program one with no biases, but I think in terms of like a driverless car, uh, you know, it, it's a proven fact already that a driverless car causes far far less accidents than a human person. And this is going to be the same thing with flying airplanes and with, uh, you know, doing coding and things like this. So eventually, I think we get to a point when you can trust the machine to make policies based on just numbers better than we can. So I think and that might be very good because I've never really been too, you know, too happy with the political establishment being run by people who have different biases. Even myself, you know, I, I probably think an AI might do a better job than myself. As president, even though I feel right now, maybe, okay, it's not smart enough yet, but in three to five to 10 years, it very much could understand what is better. When you're moving a big ship, you don't need little things. You don't need personality. You just need to understand the direction you're going. And in that sense, a, a machine might be better. So I'm not sure there is a long-term policy uh, position uh, in place for human beings. Um, it may make sense that the things that we do are the things that AI can never do uh, better than us because it's it's subjective. And for example, this might be art, or this might be futurism, or this might be writing uh, novels. Sure, an AI can already write a novel. But like I said with making wine, sometimes you don't want your, your wine made by a machine. You just want to know that somebody took eight, nine months to craft that beautiful beer or beautiful bottle of wine, and then that's what makes you feel like you really like it. And the same thing with art. So I think, as I've said before, I think we might end up being a generation, entire humanity might turn into a much more art-filled and creative process just because a lot of the technical things are being done by computers and AI. So you think it's perhaps better that we get our uh, next generation? I have two boys, like pretty much around the same age. So uh, do we get them to focus and 
uh, on more humanity studies and art because science is pretty much run by machines. Yeah, that's that's a tough call. I think at this point, you know, my advice for people with children my age is is really that try to create the best kids you can. But I don't when I say best, I don't mean like best in studies. Create nice people. Create people that other people want to be around. Create um, healthy kids, kids that aren't kind of crazy because they're on social media all day. So my my main goal of my daughters right now is to just try to create really good kids. And I would say just from a practical perspective, More to anyone, and including your and things like that. The, the, the most important thing is if you can make money, make money now. Because I'm not sure the idea of making money in 10 or 15 years is going to exist as it does now. If AI takes over so many jobs, then only the people at the top will be making money. So any chance people have to earn, a, you know, different projects, whatever, do it while you still can. And I think this is very important for our children because inheritances will become even more important than ever before if there's no job to necessarily uh, go into. So, I mean, it's, it's not the, I'm not painting a very beautiful world here, um, but these are AI, something that, you know, the world has created and we're going to have to learn to deal with it. The good news is we might have a lot more free time. And in that free time is why I think it's really important to have good, solid kids that enjoy themselves, aren't neurotic, aren't crazy with social media, uh, enjoy art, maybe play piano or guitar, like surfing, whatever it is. Um, this is going to be really important in, in raising one's kids. Produce as good, solid, fun-loving kids as you can because the world could be very different. But wanting fun and wanting to be social, that's not going to go away. But uh, like you said, right, only people at the top. You know, I read uh, Singularity uh, in 2009, around sometime, late 2009, uh, yeah. So I think it was published around 2008. And that's the place where I read the transhumanist uh, for the first time in that book. Somewhere in the book, uh, there was a reference to it. And someone even made a comment from London. That person who's quoted in the book says that the person who is in his 60th year now will live to see 1,000 years. Right? Uh, uh, but uh, I, I thought this is a very elitist thing. I kept following singularity. I, I didn't follow transhumanist as much uh, because the whole concept of singularity became much bigger and uh, much more talked about. Uh, perhaps you associate with them as well, right? I mean, uh, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know all them. Greg Kurzweil, Peter Dynas. I mean, I'm, you know, I was just interviewed by the singularity group, Singularity University. So yeah, I'm very much in term touch with all these people. Um, and uh, I actually think there are a lot of their prophecies are almost coming true now, which, you know, uh, 10 oh, years ago, we have crossed 8 billion people. How do you see this uh, being available to each and every one of us? Like you pretty much, yeah. AI is going to yeah. make the top more wealthy. How do we make up, you know, bring about a change to touch everybody's life? It can't be that <sighs> people live to thousand years, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, for, for this reason, when I've been running for president, I've always supported a universal basic income. And, and a universal basic income would provide probably free health care and at least a roof over your head and food. But how to make the singularity equal or available to everybody at the same time, I've written about this because the problem is also, what if one country discovers the singularity through AI but doesn't want to share it? You know, and this becomes a big challenge too. You know, what if China has the singularity or as, as Putin has said, uh, you know, Russia's Putin, you know, AI is the biggest goal of the, of the century, essentially. So we got to get there first. Everyone is trying to get there first. So how do we share it if it's become such a controversial thing? And how do you use it? Do, do only the generals and the presidents get to go into the singularity? Or do the, the people get to go? Or only the engineers? I mean, it's a, it's a very challenging um challenging situation i don't really have all the answers to this it seemed a lot easier to talk about five years ago when it was further away but now that we're sort of on the doorstep of a lot of these ideas i realize wow there's going to be a lot of people that get left behind or at least at, at best they go second or third and um it, it, you know it, i don't know what happens when one person goes through the singularity does it change everything else for the rest of us you know th these are very difficult questions that nobody has answers to yet so uh, uh, is that one of the efforts from you, from a point of this uh, uh, whole group that you're, uh, you're part of many of these organizations, right? Is there something right. to drive 
towards this effort? Well, I think um, right now there's a lot of drive towards what I would call a universal based skin coming. And the reason that that's important is because when you talk about the singularity being equal for everybody, right now, even life isn't equal for most people. You know, I mean, we have in even America, we have 15 million kids going to bed hungry tonight. And this is America. And they're all going to bed hungry, 15 million, like, you know, something like 10%. So the, it's already not very equal where we are. And I, I'm sure everywhere around the world is very similar. So how, you know, and so a lot of people say, well, forget about worrying about the singularity. Let's worry about just what's happening here on planet Earth. And again, that's why I've always supported universal basic income. But I would say as a policy position, what's most important for me is that we would take money away from the military and put that money into healthcare and technology development so that everybody gets to have a much better uh, life. And the reason is, for example, you know, America spends 20% of its GDP on military. And that's why we're always at war and doing this and that. I would like to take at least 10% of that and put it into fighting cancer. Let's have a battle against Alzheimer's. Let's fight diabetes. Let's overcome biological death and aging. These are kinds of battles that I would like to win, not so much fighting battles elsewhere in the world. So, you know, that's my answer to how to keep things fair. But of course, uh, I wasn't even close to being elected. So uh, there you go. <laughs> oh, are you going to give it another shot at it? Uh, yes, yes. So I'm, I'm currently doing graduate studies at the University of Oxford, but maybe in 2028 when I'm done, uh, I will um, begin to make a, another campaign run. Uh, I'll be pretty, I'll be older then, you know, I'll be in my mid fifties. So maybe it's a good time to do so. But uh, I've been uh, trying to work on uh, beefing up my resume so that I'm a stronger candidate. Fantastic. I wish you all the very best and we'll keep following you on that. Uh, uh, you know, you are a philosophy student. So how does the uh, here and now uh, from a sense of spirituality, how does that associate with uh, your, uh, your uh, what you are propagating as transhumanism? Do you see? Uh, a... what... Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I try to remain somewhat spiritual only because I realize that you know, in my opinion, this AI thing and, and, and you know, it, philosophy has taught me that we don't even know if we're living in a simulation. We can't prove anything, really. Uh, so it's very possible that even if we thought, think we die, we don't really die. We're just in some computer already uh, in like some matrix style environment. So uh, w for all those reasons, I've been humbled by life. I, I, I mean, I, ha I think we're biological beings existing on this planet that's revolving around the sun and some galaxy but you know it, it very much could be something else so i think when you talk about spirituality you just got to keep an open mind never be too critical of other people um unless they're hurting somebody i think so just try to remain open-minded and this is very difficult because in today's hyper polarized political world most people have so many opinions way too many opinions i still try to remain one who's open-minded and hears everybody's opinion Right, but how do you balance the thought of here and now from a, you know, uh, uh, it's a very uh, thought in the Hindu and Buddhism philosophy about uh, being present at the present. So how do you connect the present and forever? Well, I, I think, first off, it's impossible to understand forever from a philosophical point of view. I, I think it's impossible. Like, you can abstractly understand it, but you can never emotionally be in the future. You have to always be, and the same thing, you can never emotionally be in the past. You know, our consciousness and the way our brain formats understanding our consciousness, our mind, is, is, is basically, look, we're here and there. And whatever was here even one second ago is gone. And whatever is one second in the future, we won't get there until now, now, now. You know. So I, I, I think the here and now thing has always been worked out for me. The bigger question is, do we have free will and can we... Can we modify our path so that something better happens in the future? Um, and this is a much more tricky question. I, I tend to believe, yes, we do. We, If we are good people, karma is a very real concept. Um, not necessarily karma in the sense that there's a great God over us, but karma in the sense that by thinking positive thoughts, we end up creating a more positive environment. And if you think enough positive thoughts, maybe you create a perfectly positive environment. So the same thing can be said with transhumanism. It's a very optimistic philosophy. Um, if you can eventually build a perfect human being that doesn't suffer very much, we might be living much more fantastic lives than we are now. 
what is the price for transhumanism and who where do you think the money will come from it's... well i think the yeah i mean this is a great question in silicon valley the money comes from um people wanting to start businesses and change the world it's kind of a very romantic idea of capitalism because it it, it tends to be you know in many ways, beautiful still. You can go out there, you start a business on a technology that can help change the world. Um, you know, like Uber. Uber is a pretty good example of a technology that I use quite frequently uh, that you would think is not a very transformative technology. It wasn't that great. But someone came up with an idea that we can just immediately call a taxi and it comes where we are. And um, I use it all the time now. And I was just thinking the other day that it's not, a, it's not like Microsoft creating Windows or creating the iPhone. Uber is a very basic idea, and yet it really has made my life much more efficient because I can go wherever I want for quite a bit cheaper than taxis. I think that's the, the roadmap for a lot of technology companies in Silicon Valley. You come up with a good, solid idea. It doesn't have to be magic, and you utilize it, and if you can get it, the word out about it, you can change the world. No, but these are the guys who made money with humans as resources, right? So uh, uh, it's quite odd if you want these people who made money out of humans as resources to put the money to extend the human's lifespan so that the resources don't mean the resource. Because I think the short-livedness of resources is what makes it more valuable. But if we make it, uh, it's it's like this, right? That there's a meteorite uh, which has got a, such a huge gold and other mineral deposits and some people want to go and mine them. But the gold deposits there is supposed to be so much more that it can make each of the 8 billion people on earth uh, a billionaire age if you were to distribute the gold available there. But then logically that would mean nothing because if every individual has so much of gold, the gold's value will be nothing. So yeah, 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 no. the contradiction that getting money from this people to fund this, uh, isn't it a contradiction in that sense? Well, I think in the in the case, let's just, you know, using the symbolism, um, you know, if people live forever, then Uber can continue to make profits and drive people around forever. Let's just say, again, I'm not a big Uber fan in terms of the company. I just brought it up as a sample of the technology. But I think if you can free, create a way, as they often do in Silicon Valley, to solve problems, like, for example, in San Francisco, it's hard to get a taxi. And now you Uber comes right to you. If you can solve the technology problem. You can make a lot of money, even if you are using humans as resources. There's nothing wrong with using humans as resources, in my opinion, as long as you give a fair exchange. And in my case, you know, in the case of Uber, that's you pay $20, you get a ride downtown. It's a lot quicker and cheaper than a normal taxi. So that's a, it's a fair deal. So I think you just have to make sure your ethics kind of work out in a way. Now, I think you're right. If someone said, oh, I'm going to go up in space and get all that gold, but the, the, you're right, the value of gold would drop to zero, not zero, but maybe pennies. And um, so I think it has to, it's probably better nobody gets uh, these asteroids. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe one person would get rich, but that's not good for the world. We need technology that everybody can benefit from that's always a fair trade. Well, uh, Zoltan, uh, Ishtwan, uh, you know, Ishta is a Indian term we have uh, in uh, Canada where I come from and in Sanskrit and it means uh, uh, something to like. Ah. And uh, if I were to take Ishtavan as is, it could be likable. So <laughs> I don't uh, know if someone oh. told me about it, but uh, I, I just thought when you said it's read as Isht Ishtavan. So <laughs> ah. like uh, a term taken out of Sanskrit. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Is there something, some shout out that you want to give to our listeners and audience? Uh, uh... Sure. Well, I, I do have a little bit of big news that just happened in the last 10 days. So there was a documentary made on one of my presidential campaigns called Immortality or Bust. The documentary did very well, won a bunch of awards, um, but the distribution was only in the United States until about 10 days ago. So now anyone, anywhere in the world, can go and watch this documentary for free. It's a, it's a beautiful documentary. And my father is dying at the same time that I'm driving a coffin bus and talking about transhumanism and running for president. So it's a sad story, but it's also quite uplifting in the sense that science will eventually help us live longer. But the documentary is called Immortality or Bust. And the way for foreign, uh, for people internationally to watch it is to go to Plex TV, that's P-L-E-X, 
TV and then type in the documentary Immortality or Bust and you should be able to watch it for free there. And it took us like two years to get the international distribution. So we're very excited that it finally came out. Well, the link is given right below this podcast. So please go and click and watch. And also, uh, uh, like we mentioned, uh, Zoltan is an author. The link to the book is also there. So please feel free to click and go and get a better understanding of what Zoltan is talking about. Thank you so much, Zoltan. And just one last thing. Do you want to recommend any books, documentaries, or videos, or films for our listeners and audience? This is something sure. I want to close. Sure. Well, um, you know, obviously, I would love you to read my book. It's The Transhumanist Wager. Um, it's been, you know, translated in a few different languages, and it's sort of what launched my futurist career. And then I have a ton of other books, and I've been writing, you know, out there, essay books. I'm currently writing a lot for Newsweek. Um, but I think, you know, regarding a, a movie that I really like that I thought about when you and I were discussing is this movie Contact. Do you know this movie Contact? No. Um, it's a wonderful movie about, because you had asked this, you know, this question of who goes through the singularity first? Well, in the movie Contact, which is kind of about a woman who who's trying to use a giant satellite to reach, uh, you know, aliens or, or, or extraterrestrials, um, she finally discovers one. And the point of the story, though, is that the human race has to decide for one person to go meet this super intelligence. I, I, and I kind of thought, have, you may know the movie. You yeah. have. Yes. Anyways, it's a wonderful movie. But it, it, as we were talking, I thought, oh, wow, who would go? Who would be the very first person to go through the singularity? And it made me think of that movie as, as, a, as a means to it. But anyways, I think that's a wonderful movie. But please have your uh, have your uh, listeners, if your listeners out there and like to read my book on transhumanism, it's a kind of definitive a fictional story of the transhumanism movement and trying to overcome um, death using science and technology. Wonderful. Uh, Zoltan, thank you so much. And uh, uh, all the listeners and uh, audience, uh, if you like what you uh, just heard or saw, please follow the links are there to uh, Zoltan's uh, social handles and also the book and the documentary. So keep following and uh, Hope feel hope. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's so much more positive what you heard. So thank you so much for that, Sultan. And uh, uh, for the rest of you, thank you and uh, enjoy the ride. Thank you so much. Yeah.